Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we do have ASL integration. Part is on the screen in front of you. Please make yourselves comfortable in this space. If at any point in time you need someone to speak more slowly or louder, please gesture or shout out in some way. We want to make this as accessible as possible to as many folks as possible. Um, to start off, I'm just going to name and say briefly the affiliations for the folks on the panel here, and then I'll allow them to introduce themselves in terms of their research and their experience in relationship to students with disabilities. So I'm going to go down uh, to my right, your left, starting with um, Elise Whitmer, who is a second year student at University of Wisconsin-Madison studying computer science and digital studies. Next to her is Sarah Vogt. Sarah um, is the Associate Director of the Center for Students with Disabilities at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. Next to her is Leslie Stilton, who is an Accommodation Specialist at the McBurney Disability Resource Center here on campus. Next to her is um, Brett Ronan Nachman, who is a PhD student in the Department of Educational Leadership and policy analysis here at UW-Madison. And lastly is Kirsten Brown, who is a faculty member at Edgewood College. So if each of us can start off with saying a little bit about your relevant experience in terms of working with or doing research about students with disabilities or being a college student with a disability. Um, you said my name is Elise Whitmer. Sophomore here, I am a student registered with McCurdy with a disability, and I am also the new transition special or transition coordinator um, for McBurney. So I work with incoming freshmen who will need services, and as well as I've been a front desk aide for McBurney for the past year. Hi again, I'm Sarah Vogt from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater's Center for Students with Disabilities, where I'm the associate director. Um, in my role as associate director, I focus mainly on our transition programming. We have a summer transition program for incoming students with disabilities, as well as uh, pro um, Project Assist, which is our tutoring program, um, and, other, and other programs as well. I also have my PhD in Disability Studies from the University of Illinois at Chicago, um, and so I come from my work, I come to my work from that um, perspective as well. Good afternoon, my name is Leslie, and <clears throat> in my role as an accommodation <clears throat> specialist um, here at UW-Madison at the McBurney Disability Resource Center, I work directly with students um, registered with the McBurney Center. Um, I help facilitate the process of um, eligibility, so um, again, work to, working directly with students to understand their experience, <laughs> review uh, appropriate documentation, and uh, depending on their eligibility determination um, of their disability status, I then uh, work with a, a caseload of students who um, are registered as having a disability on our campus and help uh, support them getting access to their education by recommending accommodations and um, very often time working with them on advocating for those accommodations within the classroom or campus um, at large. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brett Nackman. Um, I am a doctoral student, and uh, much of my research focuses on the depictions and experiences of students on the autism spectrum. Um, I'm a graduate research ast assistant with the College Autism Network, which is an organization based out of Florida State University. Um, I uh, also identify someone on the autism spectrum. I have Asperger's, uh, so there's also a great rel personal relevance um, to my research. Um, as someone part of that population. Um, good morning, my name is Kirsten Brown. I'm a research faculty at Edgewood College in their doctoral program in educational leadership. Um, I'm a co-author on the book Disability in Higher Education, a Social Justice Approach, and my research focuses on neurodiversity and institutional environments um, in relation to students with disabilities. Uh, I'm learning disabled, uh, and today I'm wearing a soft, fuzzy gray coat. I'm a white woman with brown hair, and I And again, I'm Sammy Schock, so I'm a new assistant professor in Gender and Women's Studies, and my research focuses on representations of disability, race, and gender in American literature and culture. 
Um, my first book is on disability in black women's speculative fiction, um, and I also work to um, increase knowledge about disability and accessible pedagogy among my peers. Um, so our first question for the panel is what are common misconceptions you hear about college students with disabilities? And folks, feel free to speak in any order. I guess one that I hear as a student here um, that I've had sort of whispered when I go to take tests alone rather than in small groups is that I won't be prepared for the real world or I won't be prepared for graduate school or something because you know I don't do things like everyone else. But I mean, I am just as successful in what I do as everyone else. I just need a little bit different conditions, and you know, there's no way to say that I don't have that in graduate school or in my careers. But that's something that I think is a misconception: is that it's not sort of like a safety cushion. That's not what it is, it's just accessibility. Um, when I started doing, this is Sarah, when I started doing this work about eight years ago or so, um, I started getting calls from professors um, who were calling with questions about accommodation letters. And I noticed there was a pattern. It was one or two, they, they approached their questions in one or two ways. Well, my course is really rigorous, it's really tough. I don't know if this student is gonna be able to keep up. Or, on the flip side, well, you know, I really want so-and-so to be successful in my course. What can I do, you know, what kind of changes do I need to make to the curriculum to make sure that this person is successful? And so two, complete, two completely different approaches, but still with that same assumption that a student with a disability cannot be successful. Um, and so that was a really interesting um, moment for me, and it's something that I've kept in the back of my mind as I'm working with instructors, um, both in terms of responding to accommodation needs and working that, with them in terms of inclusive education models. This is Leslie, and the theme I think is going to be pretty consistent across the board because I share <clears throat> very much the same experience working directly with students. Um, Although it may be a misconception that is whispered by faculty to students or to administrators, um, students have also reflected the same perspective to me as their accommodation specialists, that they are not capable as their peers are, um, that the bar has to be lower for them. So not only is this happening, and am I observing that it happens behind the scenes, um, but it's clear to the students, um, as Elise shared too, that that, it, that message is being projected to them. And for, for many students, um, those, those of whom who have lived with um, the identity of having a disability all of their life, um, in an educational setting, they have been hearing that or feeling that from grade one. So when attending college um, and, I, and working with these students, this misconception of I, I need something more because I'm not as good um, directly um, conflicts with the view that an accommodation that, that I as, as uh, a disability service provider I would be recommending that wouldn't give you more it would give you equal so um, that that's a very common experience I have in working with students mm -hmm. is, is trying to help them see that maybe the perspective that they've really internalized, sometimes for a very long time, um, could could potentially be broken. Although that's that's a big that's a big bite. Um, I I see the same thing, the same misconceptions, particularly for students that may have newer emerging disabilities, particularly non-apparent disabilities, um, chronic health or mental health conditions that may be emerging. Um, as they approach adulthood, but the societal views of disability being less than or the bar is lower, they're, they're picking up upon that too. Um, so it's, it's a, a very pervasive issue that I see with the students that I work with. Uh, this is Brett, kind of piggybacking off of some of what you said, Leslie. I, I think one thing that we need to be mindful of, in addition to a lot of invisible disabilities, is that many students entering college from high school uh, who may have received services or accommodations may feel um, they've received a lot of stigmatization. Um, there are a lot of stigmas or a lot of negativity placed on them as students during that sector of their life. So there might be, in some cases, 
where they fail to disclose to a McBurney or another disability service uh, department on their campuses. And this could be uh, potentially problematic in terms of not receiving the assistance that they need, but more than that, just having a, a community that really wants to you know, um, offer the, you know, help them to have the same types of equal opportunities as everybody else. So I think one, one thing we need to be mindful of in our society is just um, taking, you know, taking these stigmas away, not necessarily seeing students with disabilities as lazy, lazy or incapable or what you, you all were saying. Um, and also just being, being mindful that, um, that a lot of students with disabilities at times feel like they have to prove themselves or prove their disabilities because some may not believe it. Um, certainly with autism, um, there are different types of presentations of it. And I know in terms of my own experiences, um, along with perhaps others who have um, more invisible disabilities, if you want to call it, um, that there, there is a sense of having to um, kind of demonstrate your worth and, and, and kind of identify that, hey, you know, you are like everybody else, but there are certain challenges that, um, that you face that aren't as apparent as perhaps um, other types of disabilities. But collectively, I think we as a society just need to be mindful that there's a spectrum of disabilities, um, that there's also a lot of comorbidity of different disabilities, and also there's a lot of intersectionality of identities, disabilities, and other identities that are core to a person's experience. And we need to be able to disaggregate based on those different types of identities um, and recognize um, that every student who enters college wants to have the same opportunities for success in their academics, in their social life, um, in their professional development as anyone else. So the more we kind of level the playing field for everyone, and, and, but also being mindful of the distinguishing factors that mark students with disabilities, I think the more we can collectively move toward a, a, a more just society. Um, this is Kirsten. I think uh, to echo what everyone else has said, the a common misconception is that disability is a deficit rather than um, creativity, diversity, an asset. Um, other misconceptions that I see particularly within the literature is that access is only the responsibility of the Office of Disability Services, and in reality, access is the responsibility of everyone on a campus. Um, common misperceptions that the literature shows about particularly faculty is that they assume students with disabilities are going to take more time, um, and research has shown this in particular uh, students with autism or learning disabilities may take more of the faculty members' time. Uh, common misconceptions of practitioners is that students with disabilities, or administrators, is that students with disabilities cost more money. And actually there's a study of the Wisconsin state system that shows that that's not, with the, with the exception of very few types of disabilities, that's actually not true. Um, and the state of Wisconsin has done a, a pretty comprehensive budget on that. It's, it's about seven years old. Um, and then the last misperception, I think, is that all disabilities and all students with disabilities are the same. And we tend to see within research that people with disabilities are lumped into one large sum. And that's simply not true. Um, people's bodies and minds have different ways of being in the environment. And that really uh, affects not only education, but daily living. And so when we look at disability, we need to look at the diversity that happens within that broad category. Thank you. Um, so can each of you speak now to some of the challenges that your campuses face in offering spaces for college students with disabilities to engage with one another and with the college community more generally, or on the flip side of that, opportunities that you've been able to create for this sort of interaction? Um, I actually noticed an accessibility in a couple of my online classes, an accessibility issue in online classes that I've had for the past couple of years. And that is that a lot of videos are uploaded with no captions. Um, a lot of recorded lectures, YouTube videos with no captions. Um, a lot of reading materials are like pictures or JPEGs of um, text that can't be read with the reader um, easily. And I feel like, not as someone who experiences that, but as someone who works with people who do, that, that could pose 
a large issue in that, especially having that original barrier can cause sort of a mental hesitation in students of, oh, you know, maybe this professor didn't think about it, or maybe they just don't care. And, you know, in other situations, I've had that thought of, I wonder if they'll actually help, I wonder if they'll care. And I feel like that original accessibility, like right off the bat, is really important in fostering that relationship. So Sarah, again, um, from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, um, we're known for our physical access on campus. Um, and that's not to say by any means are we perfect. <laughs> um, one of the things that I, I really like for our students is, and, and this is in comparison to the last university I worked at, um, our student groups have a large connection center. Um, and so student identity-based groups don't necessarily have these segregated places on campus um, where they gather, where it's more of a connected intersectional space um, where students can interact with each other. Um, and and I, I really like that as a model for cultural centers, although I recognize that people do need safe spaces of their own as well. One of the difficulties I've noticed um, is the resistance to creating um, cool down or quiet spaces on campus for individuals that need that might be in sensory overload or need a space to just gather themselves. Um, one of the responses we get a lot is, well, the student can just go back to their dorm room. But that completely ignores the fact that that shouldn't be the only place a student could go. There are commuter students who don't have um, don't have that access, and what about for faculty and staff? I mean, yes, I do have my own office, but is there another place, um, you know, where kind of that that um, quiet space could be located as well? And that's that seems to be kind of a um, something that we're tackling right now. This is Leslie, and um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I'd like to start with the opportunities, and when I when I hear that question, I think about it um, from the student perspective. What opportunities, um, not just for physical space, but for opportunities to to even philosophically have a space to um, participate in anything that they may be interested in around their disability? Um, and we UW Madison does have several specific student organizations that. Um, both provide awareness or the opportunity to celebrate um, an identity around disability. For instance, um, Speakers Bureau is a student organization where individuals can um, share their story and uh, speak about their identity around disability, as well as um, the ADA, the Advocates for Diverse Abilities, is a student organization that allows students to <clears throat> Um, whether individuals with disabilities or allies are um, participating in awareness and, and working to minimize the stigma um, and bring disability to the table. Um, but then there are also student organizations and groups that um, allow individuals to meet with one another and be a part of their own community whether that is eye to eye, um, allowing students with attention deficits or learning disabilities to work with middle school students um, in the community um, to, to come together and to share, have shared experiences or um, the group as we are for individuals with autism spectrum disorders just to come together as a community and share um, whatever feels right. So those very basic level but very impactful opportunities are there um, but where I want to bro also broaden the opportunity that um, I see campus-wide is very recently there has been um, an all-campus uh, campus climate survey that um, was um, delivered and data that came back from that uh, was really useful not just in understanding the perspectives of all populations on our campus, including people in a variety of different uh, marginalized groups, but the simple fact that disability was included as a category, I think, is an, a really important opportunity um, and, a, and a, 
a positive experience for this university to highlight the experiences of individuals with disabilities as well as other identity groups and where they intersect, but also where those are very uniquely um, impactful. And having that data is, is an important opportunity because it brings disability to the forefront as a social justice issue. And I think oftentimes one of the challenges that likely not just this university faces is that um, disability isn't always talked about. It's, it's not on that list, or at least not high up on the list of, of different identities and different groups and the experiences people have. So I think those are all opportunities, both small and large. Um, around barriers, though, um, I, I certainly echo Sarah's experience at University of Wisconsin Whitewater in quite literally that there are limited physical spaces for people to practice their health, well-being, minimize their sensory um, information um, that is not just residence halls. Um, and then lastly, I know I'm taking a lot of time, um, I wanted to highlight that um, because there is there there has been such an increase, at least on our campus and I know nationwide, for students that have um, non-apparent disabilities, um, particularly those around mental health disorders, um, those individuals, as Brett previously mentioned, um, they, they may feel that they have to prove or they're, it's not clear what their disability is, and they're often finding, as reported to me, that the classroom is not accessible as it is currently structured. And we'll likely get into this more in further questions, but um, the space of the classroom may be physically accessible. They may be able to enter that room, but the structure, that space as a structure and as, as the curriculum is set up, has not been, is not accessible to them. Um, so I just wanted to highlight those things and go into detail with further questions. Can I just jump in one more time? I think, too, there's this assumption that there's an end to access, right? It's like, well, if we just have X, Y, and Z, then we'll finally have access across campus. Well, there's always new access needs that are going to require new creativity. There's access needs that conflict with one another, and how do you how do you negotiate that? And so, like any issue with diversity, it's an ongoing process, and it's never going to end. And so, I think that's something that your comments made me think of. That it's we got to keep going, and we will keep going. Have to keep going. Yeah. So sorry. You're fine. I'll piggyback off of what you're saying because I think too we need to recognize that certain disabilities or certain individuals' experiences, there's some, sometimes fluidity to disability. So if you think of perhaps someone who might be considered quote unquote able-bodied and gets into an accident and they have to use a wheelchair for a few months. So in that person's experience, perhaps there's a different perspective of viewing the world and also accessing different parts of campus where perhaps they have to take a side entrance into a building that's much farther. Um, also, you know, the notion of we're talking about classrooms. Um, most syllabi should have a, a diversity statement that addresses different identities and experiences. Not all faculty members may read that, dis that diversity statement in class. So that little action, by maybe not spending that one minute in addressing this, um, not only does it disregard students with disabilities, it also disregards students with other identities, um, but it also, um, it also presents that, okay, this is embedded into the syllabus, this is not a priority in the type of classroom that I am designing as an instructor. So I think that's a very minor thing that's um, easily correctable and really an opportunity. Um, also, what based on what you were saying, Leslie, as far as that UW-Madison and other colleges are have, offer a wide variety of organizations, hopefully in many cases, to address not only disabilities more broadly, but also particular types of disabilities and intersectionality of disabilities. I think we also need to recognize that we also, we don't want to completely segregate students. We need to have, and there are many examples of this, organizations and programs that really unite anyone. And, and, and mind you, it could be based on a common interest, but it could also be where maybe it's embedded under a program, but it's inviting students who are quote unquote able-bodied. And I know there there is definitely um, th there are different connotations in terms of usage of, of words like that. So I want to recognize that first and foremost. 
but I think having opportunities where there are like buddy programs, um, like what you were saying too, or just mentorship where um, students, no matter how they, they identify, whether as a disability or not, can have that peer they can turn to. In some cases, there's absolutely value to that common experience, but there's also value in being able to have that exchange of ideas and experiences. Um, and I think also what's worth mentioning in terms of being a challenge, but it can become a classroom opportunity, that student who has a disability, whether other students in the class know about it or not, that that person is not pigeonholed as the, the person who is, who is to s s serve as the voice of the disabilities community or of that particular disability. We recognize with many types of disabilities, if not all, there's a spectrum in terms of experience, in terms of challenges, but also, to, to Kirsten's point, we need to look at things from less of a deficit model. So think of the unique skills that individual students with disabilities bring to the table perhaps a higher level of, of perceptiveness about the world because they rely on other senses more heavily. With the autism spectrum, um, just like me personally, um, in terms of like I, um, I'm very hyper, hyper focused on things that interest me and I'm able to be very detail oriented. So I try to, I try to really enhance the, the, the positive sides of um, my identity as opposed to focus too much on the difficulties that I may have at times with not being able to recognize people in unfamiliar contexts if I know them. So I think as colleges, as campuses, and in classrooms, uh, we need to not only be more open about that, we need to provide more inclusive spaces with disabilities for the point of this lecture, um, but we also need to let students know about opportunities that might be interesting and important. So earlier this semester, there was a lecture on campus as part of the distinguished uh, lecture series um, featuring Niall DeMarco, who's a, a prominent um, person in the in the disabilities community. Examples like that, having those spaces, inviting those speakers in, that's a huge opportunity, not just for students with disabilities, but also for the community more broadly in terms of learning uh, with and from one another. Thank you. This is Kirsten. So I operate right now in a, in a kind of unique position and then I primarily work with graduate students. Um, and so in my previous lives, uh, I have worked uh, with undergraduates and I, I ran res halls for five years, for example. So when someone would tell me that, that, that someone, a student can just go back to their dorm room to decompress, no, because <laughs> a residence hall is in many ways overstimulating for a lot of people. Uh, it is not a space to decompress and I've lived there for five years, so I can tell you that. <laughs> um, so, but in my current role, I think some of the challenges and opportunities I see are different because I work with a different population. Um, and in particular, one of the challenges uh, we see with, I think, graduate students is the, am I good enough? Am I still disclosing? Do people care? Stigma associated with disability because at the doctoral level um, you're supposed to be perceived as valid and um, you're supposed to be in the in the room because you're deemed as worthy um, the doctoral process is not for everyone and so there is some weeding out that happens and I think that causes some stigma usually when I'm talking about this with faculty members or doing a training I'll actually pull up a segment of my dissertation that went out to my committee and use it as an example of stigma. Uh, and this segment of the dissertation, uh, so my, work, my research looked at two-year public institutions, four-year public institutions, and four-year private institutions, which means myself as a learning disabled and dyslexic person who cannot spell very well, um, had to write public institution no less than a hundred times. And at some point, I perhaps spelled that as pubic institution, and that went out to my entire committee. So that was slightly embarrassing. One of my committee members was very kind and pointed that out to me, so it didn't go into press that way. This is stigma. And the fact that I'm actually pointing this out and using this as an example here in this space is an opportunity mm -hmm. to educate folks and to call that out and to name that. Um, 
So I think also to echo the campus climate data, we have a lot of opportunities here to use data as a method of having a conversation about ableism on our campuses. So that survey is here um, at, at Madison. There's campus climate data for other large state system schools. And trying to work collaboratively to platform disability as an important topic. <coughs> so that would be what I would say the opportunities are. So we've started to address this a little bit, but if folks want to speak a little bit more to the overlooked or unaddressed topics in the research literature on students with disabilities or overlooked issues within <coughs> disability service offices for students with disabilities. Um, I think one of the things that I've come across is it is very hard to find national data on graduation and retention rates for students with disabilities, not to mention intersectional data that looks at other aspects of, of the students' identities. Um, and so that's been that's been something just on a base not basic, but on a basic data level that I've I've found really difficult. Um, one of the things I am excited about is um, the new organization DREAM, which stands for Disabil suck at acronyms. Disability Research, Education, and Mentoring. It's the first national organization for students with disabilities. And not only do they provide that mentoring and education, um, but they also do research as well, which, um, which I think is really exciting to see. This is Kirsten. I'm going to echo what Sarah yeah. said. The Dream Network has done an amazing job. It's very new, um, and it's a very exciting to see that happening. Mm -hmm. so, that's my top thoughts. <laughs> I think I think within the um, the classroom setting, I think needless to say, you're taking a 15, 16 week course. There are limitations in what type of content to be covered depending on what course you're in. However, I think really any type of course can be utilized to incorporate the voices and perspectives of individuals with disabilities. So for instance, let's say you're taking an American history class. Maybe you've covered the, uh, maybe you're covering you know, um, 1776 to Civil War era or a little bit past that. Um, there's an opportunity not, not only including uh, discussions and readings about Washington and Jefferson, and during the Civil War era, maybe you're talking about Lincoln and, and other prominent figures. Harriet Tubman, we know that she was a very famous individual, um, you know, very important in terms of the Underground Railroad. She, she actually had ep epilepsy. How often do we hear about things like that, realizing some of the challenges or, or opportunities that individuals from these historic figures faced? Um, Stephen Hawking, we know more modern era, you know, he has ALS. Helen Keller, we know blindness, but um, Steven, Steven Spielberg, maybe you're taking a film studies class, he has dyslexia. Um, Frida Kahlo experienced uh, physical disabilities. So there are individuals in all these different walks of life who have, have or had, in their case, disabilities, but it's not entered into the conversation. So this is a a very smooth and, and easy way of integrating this as a learning opportunity for students to realize that not only were these um, really interesting and amazing individuals, but they also had other identities that we uh, don't typically talk about. Um, Can I yeah. jump in? This yeah. is Sarah. I think it's also really important, this is the historian and cultural studies person in me. Um, it's really important not only just to recognize individuals with disabilities, um, but also you know, the history and the systematic exclusion of individuals with disabilities and other minority groups throughout history. Um, for example, include information on eugenics movement. Um, you know, and so I think it's, the individual stories are great, um, but also I think it's important, you know, history just isn't about those individuals. And so that needs to be broadened and, and just, and, and looked at strategically and systematically in terms of ableism throughout history or whatever topic you're looking at, um, like you would other, um, um, yeah. No, I, I completely agree.
completely agree. Yes. This is Kirsten. And so I, in writing a 500 plus page book, this really gives you the opportunity to focus on what's overlooked, what's absent in the literature. Um, and so I'd say within the disability and higher ed scholarship, unlumping disability. And so a lot of studies treat students with disabilities as the same and don't break those categories out. Um, we have an opportunity to talk about campus climate. Another area I think is really missing is a digital campus climate conversation. Oftentimes, our conversations about websites and technology end at, are they screen reader accessible? Is this, is this compliant? Does this have captions? And don't address the content of the website at all. How are we portraying, how are we defining and describing disability on our websites? Um, in our print materials. And then we typically think about transition and transition in as someone coming from K-12 education. But there's a real gap within the literature about people who are adult learners coming back. Um, there is a gap about uh, students who are veterans. So there are multiple ways that people will transition into higher education that are not considered and the transition out of higher education whether that's into the career or graduate school, is, is kind of, I think, a gap that's an overlooked topic within this area. It's important to note that access benefits everyone. And I really think that when we talk about accessibility and inclusion, we leave that part out. So, for example, um, one of the things I like to, I, I serve tables all the way through grad school. <laughs> this is how I funded my education, right? Um, and I worked in, in a bar outside of the Brewer Stadium in Milwaukee. Um, and they always used to have the baseball games on, and it'd be loud, and captions were running. Now, the captions function in for people who are either deaf or hard of hearing. But if you wanted in the bar to know what was happening in the baseball game, you really didn't need to read the captions. So everyone benefited. And I think if we had that mentality about access, um, it would go a lot further because in a lot of cases, accommodation is simply good pedagogy. It's good teaching practice. Everyone benefits if videos are captioned or if the articles are um, available to be screen reader accessible. A lot of my doctoral students and my graduate students have difficulty keeping up with the amount of reading material in my courses. And the first thing I do is tell them to get a $10 app for their iPhone that will read pretty much everything to them because they have a long commute. Some of them drive from Janesville, some of them drive from York County. They can read multiple articles simply by listening to the article while in the car. That benefits everybody. So I think that's an overlooked topic as well. So we're going to transition now into thinking about things we've addressed a lot of the things that have been overlooked, the issues that we have, so we want to move towards discussing solutions, things that we can do better. Um, so the first question, and I'll, I'm going to jump into more of these um, now in my role as a faculty member, but so the first question here is how can faculty members create more welcoming and accessible classroom environments for students with disabilities, whether or not students disclose to them? Did you want to go, Sandy? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I think one thing is Sarah and Brett were already talking about is including disability in our in our syllabi, in our curriculum. As a disability study scholar, this is pretty easy for me. But even in my courses that are not about disability, um, so for example, I'm teaching a course on social justice literature this semester, and I made sure that there were representations of disability within this larger course that is generally about gender and social justice literature. But I talk about disability as another social justice issue that my students could be thinking about and addressing. I think one of the biggest things, um, as a junior faculty member who gets observed by my senior <laughs> colleagues is there are often questions about your students all have laptops out i don't ban laptops in my classroom often 
faculty members want to ban laptops from the classroom and tell our students that only if they have an accommodation and then they may even have to sit in a particular space in the classroom if it's a big lecture hall. This identifies students with disability. It doesn't help students who don't have a diagnosis yet or don't have their paperwork yet. And it treats our students like they're not adults. They can learn how to pay attention. They can make choices about when to pay attention and when not to. I went to college and didn't have a laptop with me, and I didn't pay attention all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> it's fine I can say that I have a PhD now. <laughs> so I think that we have some misconceptions about what is and is not accept acceptable behavior in the classroom. And there are things we can do to be more accessible and inclusive for students, whether or not they disclose, that help students in all kinds of ways, including some basic things in the classroom. We'll have a discussion, and I'll say, somebody Google that. Someone look that up right now so we can just figure that out, because I don't know everything. Um, so that's one thing that I think has been important in my classroom, is pushing to do more accessible things for everyone, to have accommodation policies for everyone on certain things um, that for me does not reduce the quality of the education that I'm providing or the experience of my students in the classroom. I guess I've noticed as someone who answers the phones from McMurray quite a few times a week um, that one of the things that I've noticed is a shift in professors calling and asking what can I do to make my classroom more accessible, is this accessible, is this text readable, is this font okay, and I guess just one thing that I always say is just always kind of have that question in the back of your head. Is this my classroom generally accessible? Am I putting out things that people can access if they can't make it to class? You know, lecture capture is a huge, a, a huge bonus to people, even people who don't have diagnosed disabilities. Um, you know, putting slides online, putting outlines, notes, anything that can make those days accessible that people might need to miss for, you know, disability related or they might not even know it's disability related have the flu, you know, and, and no one should be punished in their learning for needing to miss a day, whether it's disability related or not. Um, I think universal design for learning is a very important um, way to address access, of course, um, and this is again access for individuals with without disabilities, um, you know, yes, presenting your material, what you're teaching in a variety of formats. Um, lecture-based, discussion-based, videos, etc., but also multiple forms of assessment types. Um, not everyone is going to do good on a multiple choice exam. Not everyone is going to do well on an essay exam. Um, looking at how we think of participation in the classroom, um, maybe that's not just about talking. Um, maybe you know there's other activities you can do to show to sh so students can demonstrate that they're engaged. Um, I think too, and I think this also applies to all students, every student is the expert in their own needs, right? And how they can best learn the material. Um, you know, at, in my role, you know, working with students at a, a disability center, disability services center, um, I get a lot of calls from instructors. They receive the accommodation letter and they want to ask, and it's often well-intentioned, okay, well, will this work with, for this student? Is this going to be okay for that student? I don't know. Um, I'm not the student. Like, it may very well be. It may not be. Um, and, um, you know, I can't count the number of times I say, well, have you talked to so-and-so? Um, oh, no, can I do that? Yes, yeah, please talk to them. <laughs> If we need to have a discussion of the, between the three of us that's collaborative and thinking about creative solutions, I'm more than happy to be a part of that. But step one is talk to the person who's, who has expressed needs to you in whatever format. Um, I, recently I had um, a professor who, um, one, of, one of his students had recording lectures as an accommodation, which is a touchy subject for many instructors. Um, but, you know, he came, to, he, he came to me and said, well, you know, research has shown that transcripts are actually more accessible for individuals than audio recordings. I don't care. This, 
student ne needs the audio version. The transcript is mm -hmm. not going to be accessible for them. Not only to mention, oh, are you going to transcribe your lectures then? But, um, you know, this assumption that, same thing with laptops. Research has shown that if you handwrite, you better um, internalize the material. You better, you know, it, it feels like research has shown is the new, well, they say. I'm not worried about they. I'm worried about the person in front of me and what they need to be, well, I just said they, like what they need to be to have the access. Um, and so those are the, um, you know, one of the key things is really that every student is the expert in how they learn best. So. I'm not sure, this is Leslie, I'm not sure what more I can say. Um, I feel like I can just sit back because everyone has covered so much, but I, I suppose an effort to hear my own voice. I will ask one more thing. Um, and that, that is um, helping, fa I don't know who, again, the, the, the they would be, but helping equip faculty to understand how to teach under the conditions that they are teaching. Yeah. So um, universal design for learning, I, I use that phrase often when I'm working with faculty as well, when they call with um, the curiosity of how can I be more supportive, how can I make my, my class accessible. Um, it, it is, it's a moving target, and it's, as Sarah has mentioned, it's unique to that individual student. There are some things that they can do, as outlined by these great panelists. Um, but it's also about shifting the mindset of, um, I need to do something extra. It's about moving it back, to, or moving it to, uh, this should just be my practice. My practice is that I will um, have alternate forms of assessment. I will um, not have such rigid deadlines. I think that's one of the biggest issues for many of the students that I work with is, is rigid deadlines. Exams occur on this date. Uh, it, assignments are due on this date and period, end of story. So having that ability to be flexible. Um, but at University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, that's all I can speak to, but um, I work with faculty who have upwards of 700 students and they're just, they reflect that they feel that they uh, are caught between a rock and a hard place mm -hmm. of how do I allow so much flexibility or, um, a, a, um, you know, provide universally designed ways of, of learning and, and allow for students to do things that are best for them when I, I can't possibly. You know, there's a lot of that, that back and forth. So I don't, I don't have an answer. I, I want to recognize that it's a struggle for faculty. It doesn't change the fact that that class needs it. it students need access. All students need access in that class. Um, but faculty having finding more support on how can we teach under the conditions that we're given um, and do it in an accessible way and, and um, rather than saying this accommodation is unreasonable because I just have too many students or I don't have time and, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is Brett. I'm going to be the third person to mention universal design. Um, <laughs> one, because that was in my notes, but two, I really appreciate the, the points that both both of you made. Um, I think these practices are relatively simple for faculty to incorporate with given enough training and given enough um, insight into how to make little modifications that don't require offering that extra thing. So, so just to kind of add some, to some points that both of you made, um, I think if you have a faculty member who utilizes PowerPoint, um, immediately put that, on, that PowerPoint online not only is it going to serve perhaps that student who couldn't make class that day, but it also um, may help the student who's in that class and is not able to document everything in time. I know it's a very simple thing, but it can make a big difference. Um, I think also, kind of like what you were saying, Sarah, as far as um, flexibility and use in terms of different offerings for students. So if you have a given topic or an assignment, have that stu student demonstrate multiple means of their knowledge. So maybe for one student, that might be crafting a video. For others, it might be designing an art project. For others, it might be uh, a regular presentation. So to have that option, and it also serves as a mechanism for allowing that student to capitalize on whatever their skills are. So you're really harnessing their interests and their expertise, and you're val valuing the voice that they have. 
Um, I also think, that, and this might be a little bit more difficult to implement in a large lecture hall, um, but in smaller seminar classes or discussion groups or labs, this technique could work. First day of class, pass around sheets of paper or, if, or to, to make it even more accessible, um, have students use their laptops to type um, their responses. Ask students the prompt, what can I do as an instructor to make this the best type of class possible to support your learning? You're not necessarily telling them to disclose anything that they don't want to. It's how can I best support your learning? So whether that might mean maybe offering more explicit directions to assignments. It could be um, having you know, those PowerPoints online, as I mentioned earlier. Giving students that opportunity is really important because you might have in your mindset, oh, this is going to serve all my students. But unless you really know your student population, um, your, your tools may prove ineffective. Um, and, and I think universal design is not only something important for faculty members to know about, but also graduate students who want to be faculty members. Um, thankfully, last semester I co-taught an online inclusive teaching class, and universal design was kind of core to our entire experience. We were kind of professing this to our own students who are future faculty. And at the end of the semester, they were to demonstrate not only their subject area, as far as what they would teach in a class, but show how they would incorporate universal design principles. So maybe this isn't accessible to all fields of study, but having <coughs> students um, really um, show how they could articulate this in their own field, in their own studies, um, is a really major opportunity. I think I would echo and build off what everyone has said. I'm sorry, this is Kirsten. What everyone has said so far, um, is particularly in regards to Sammy's comment about laptops. So um, I can very vividly remember as an undergraduate staring out the window and looking at the trees in my honor statistics course. I teach stats for a living. <laughs> I, no laptop in front of me, but beautiful trees. Um, as far as universal design, um, one of the practices I do is everyone gets my notes. My PowerPoints and my notes, and they get them before class, and I post them online. Now, that does require that I am organized enough to have stuff done prior to class. <laughs> um, and I'll be very honest that I'm not always that organized, but it gives me a goal to try, because there is nothing sacred about my notes, and everyone should have access to them. Um, right now, uh, I would say we do a very good job of video recording our class because I have a student who took a position in DOA and there is an eight hour time difference and they are not able to um, be part of the class community but they still need to finish their dissertation so this benefits everyone um, and it's another example of universal design it does bring in captioning um, and transcription pr prices and costs associated with that and then I wanted to echo the disability statement and I want to actually build off of um, a talk that WISCA posted previously with Z. Nicolazzo, and that's N-I-C-O-L-A-Z-Z-O. -Z -Z -O. And Z talked about non-performative statements. And this is um, making sure that, and drawing off the work of Sarah Ahmed, so A-H-M-E-D, and, and Sarah's work, and, and this is the gap between what we say and what we do. So not just having a statement on your syllabi, but talking about the statement, and then connecting to Brett's example of asking your students, either in the form of a class contact, or a survey question, or a get to know you, how can I help you learn better? So don't just state it on your syllabi, do something with it. This is Sammy again. Um, so we wanted to leave the last half hour for some questions. Um, so the last question we didn't quite get to on in terms of how institutions can um, strengthen inclusion and accessibility, but I think we did address some of those things and we might in addressing your questions. So we'd like to open it up for questions now. Um, if you can raise your hand or otherwise gesture um, that you have a question and then if necessary, we can revoice um, if folks can't hear the question. It's right here. Uh, I'm a faculty member from MATC and working on a grant on how to support the learning of students with invisible disabilities. We see this as a major problem, especially in English classes, 
where there are students uh, with depression, anxiety, order disorders, other such things. And uh, what I'm looking for are suggestions on what we can include in this resource for faculty members and how to, how to support the learning of students with invisible disabilities. Um, this is Sammy. I can start with some of the things that I do. Um, so anytime I have a student who um, may have flexibility in terms of um, deadlines or class attendance, I work on a plan with them in advance. So one thing is if they miss a day of class that they just send me a two to three page response on the readings. And if there's someone that struggles with writing, I have them set up a time typically during office hours where I'm sitting often by myself for two hours anyway, um, to come speak to me about the readings when they are able to again. Um, and in terms of flexibility with deadlines, if a student comes to me and says, okay, I'm not, not ready yet, I can't submit it by the deadline, I have them suggest what the deadline is. Rather than me just making something up out of my head, I say, okay, when can you have it to me? That's your new deadline and communicate with me otherwise. So flexibility with deadlines as much as possible within a course and having a plan for what students can do to demonstrate that they're keeping up with the material if possible um, when they are not in the classroom is another way that I try to work with students with physical disabilities. Uh, this is Kirsten and I've actually taught at MATC so um, and, I, and it's one of my favorite places to teach because Students with non-apparent disabilities are one component of the diversity in the classroom, but a lot of the things that you could do within the scope of that grant are also going to benefit your other student populations. And I think, um, for example, international students, English language learner students, um, there's a, a people who may not necessarily, adult learners, people who have been out of school for a while. Um, so broadening the scope a little bit. I would also echo what Sammy said about uh, deadlines, and I will be very honest that I was a faculty member who was very rigid with deadlines up until this past fall semester in which I had a kid. <laughs> oh, and let me just tell you, welcome to parenting. Um, <laughs> and then I realized very quickly how important those flexibilities are for not only students with disabilities, but parents. And which are a high portion of MATC's population. And so then I started asking people, well, look at your other classes, look at the rest of your life, and when do you think you might be able to get that assignment to me by? Because odds are, I'm not gonna grade it at Tuesday at 6 p.m. on a blah, blah, blah date when it was due. Because my kid's throwing up. All right, so then there's a the reality of, of what lived experience looks like. Um, other things, if you're having a grant, and I like grants, and I like money, and I like other people's money, uh, your students have very large fiscal access issues. And so asking for other people's money for technology. And in particular, some schools, and I'm not sure if Whitewater is one of them, I know Grinnell is one of them, provide things like Read Write Gold to all students and alumni free of cost. So what in that grant can you ask for that could be for students with non-visible disabilities but could benefit your entire student population by getting a license for the entire institution? What is Read, Write, Write, Go? It is a text-to-speech software that will help um, folks. And you can also chime in on, it does a lot of other really cool stuff too. Yeah, um, this, Sarah, we don't have Read, Write, Gold, to my knowledge. Okay. We have Kurzweil though, that, that's, which is a similar. Yes, it's, it's, yep, I was just going to. Um, to it's K-U-R-Z-W-E-I-L. Mm -hmm. um, and um, a similar program um, that combines, it's not simply text to audio, it, it's a combination of visual and audio. Mm -hmm. so. Um, laptops. Students in my MATC classes would have to schedule when they could do their papers because they did not have access to computers. Can you write a grant that gets access for checking out laptops? Um, so access to technology that will assist not only students with 
learning disabilities and other disabilities, but your entire student population would be what I would encourage. And if I can step in <clears throat> really briefly, too, in thinking about, um, as you identify, particularly <coughs> focusing on populations of individuals with mental illness and mental health disorders, you mentioned anxiety and depression, um, absolutely having an interactive process, faculty learning how to have an interactive process with students to understand what their needs are in particular, um, and certainly technology, I, I, I strongly am totally on board with that, but also understanding that um, other resources around, I, I, I don't know what role it would play, but understanding that when someone is living with a mental health disorder, there are many other things in their life that they have to be aware of in that um, having ongoing regular um, health care. I mean, we all need health care, but mental health care. Um, the access to community mental health care can be very challenging as well. So that's one more piece to the puzzle for someone who is um, in, in college, has any other identity as well, um, any other challenges that anyone would have, and then also is working through the process of accessing ongoing and supportive mental health care within the community. Um, so, um, and this, this can impact them in, in ways that perhaps students might um, need to take a, a, a reduced credit load because they are juggling not only symptoms but also appointments or um, there, there's just any number of ways that, that that can also impact a student. But that interactive process that faculty, it focuses on faculty learning how to support a student as I think it's been clear in a lot of other ways too, it's, it's, un, it's speaking with that individual and asking them how they can and I think uh, the faculty I work with feel, in a lot of cases, nervous about doing that and not wanting to cross any boundaries. But it's, it's a very human question from educator to, to learner. Other questions? Yes. Um, so I'm here to represent some of the advising community. And so one of the, the things that's become very salient in my mind, and I see some of my other advising and career people here, is that there is an entire part of an educational experience that's often not integrated into students' experience with disabilities. And so um, just trying to understand how can advising and career also think about universal design and how we can be more welcoming and helpful to students with disabilities, but also how can people having conversations with students with disabilities um, bring into the conversation, have you talked to your advisor about your needs? Because I'm finding that there's a lot of students who may have a disability who don't disclose it, and it very much impacts the choice in classes, the physical locations of things, and that's not something that they even think to bring up, and they don't think to ask about accommodations for an advising appointment. Mm -hmm. Because it's a part of an educational experience that I recognize as educational, mm -hmm. but they might not. So just throwing it out. Um, I, I can speak for, for myself and the practice with the students with my work, and I am always talking about course, courses and course load. And, and and encouraging students to work with their advisors for those very same reasons. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad to hear and I, that, that advising um, staff are, are aware of it, but we run into this issue in a lot of ways where students aren't comfortable disclosing. We, we often, I mean, I, I feel like students with a disability are in a unique position. What other, and there's probably other populations, but what other populations are, are we asking ongoing regular outing of oneself and, and having to to regularly ask for those needs in, in this kind of academic setting which for many of the students it is a triggering setting in and of itself um, so and this, these are individuals who may not identify as having a disability um, it's it's not something that's at the forefront of their mind and they may also just want to feel like it's not always an issue. They might not want to bring it up. So there could be like a lot of layers as to why they're not bringing it up. Um, I'm always bringing it up, but I think it's also a, a good thing we can universally design just our interactions with people, whether it's advisors or whatnot, asking that question of, you know, 
is there anything else, <clears throat> I usually ask this at the, the end of my first intake with the students, so we've talked about all this stuff, and the focus for me is always disability impacts, but at the end of that appointment, I say, is there anything else that I should know about? Anything else that's impacting you that might, um, might pose as, as any kind of concern, um, you know, any injuries or traumas or anything you want me to know? And a lot of, the, I, I'm shocked sometimes as to what comes out with that simple question. So I'm just kind of thinking, if that could be incorporated, if students aren't outwardly coming out with their disability status, is that something that, that is that inappropriate for an advisor to say, okay, so we're going to sit down and plan out your courses, but is there anything that I should know about? Um, and they don't have to go into detail, but just so that they understand your role as an advisor and what, you know, what you're there to do is to help them find the best courses. Because students, I, I usually, I'm, I'm just sharing with them, Find a balanced schedule. Talk to your advisor about a balanced schedule. Um, if, if reading is tough for you, that doesn't mean it's it's good for you to take physics, chem, and stats all in one semester because you figure it's all going to be quantitative. That's still a really hard schedule. Um, I would give this is Kirsten. I would give each the advising community two tangible options. One, and particularly career services, the National um, data uh, collected by the government shows that individuals with disabilities are underemployed and unemployed at substantively higher rates than the rest of the community. So proactively working with students to identify internships and work experience. And then also, um, for, particularly for career advisors, helping students with apparent disabilities discuss that and to work through that stigma with their employer because unfortunately the own the onus is on the student um, and for students with non-apparent disabilities to figure out do I want to disclose it in the process when do I want to disclose how do I make this transition to the workforce is voc rehab an option for me so that's one thing for that the other thing is I've seen ADARS on this campus and that thing is really problematic for so if the advising community was to tackle one thing Making a degree audit report legible? legible yeah. <laughs> I don't even have like a word for that. Um, screen reader accessible, but something, there, there has got to be, with the amount of resources and, and brilliant people on this campus, to make that a little bit more understandable to not only students, but employees. And the reason I say this is I'm on multiple disability groups. And someone with a visual impairment on one of my employee groups posted yesterday or the day before saying, I'm an advisor and I have a visible disability and it takes me about three times as long to read a degree at a DARS report. What can, what can be done about this? Mm -hmm. um, so it's not only affecting your students, it's affecting the people who work in your advising community as well. So that would be just one tangible thing for the community to consider. And if I could jump on that, I'm, this is Sarah. Um, in terms of you know ways that institutions can strengthen um, inclusion, we have to also recognize that it's not just about students with disabilities, but faculty and staff with disabilities as well. Um, you know, and figuring out not only our access needs, but then how we interact with other offices on campus. Um, one thing that I tend to do is I often out myself as someone who identifies as disabled in my meetings with students. It's not to try to project my own experiences onto that student, but just to kind of give them in the back of their mind a sense that like, okay, I've been there. Um, and then I feel that that helps them open up to me a little bit more and maybe they'll say things like, or it may come from the other way, like would it make sense for your disability services coordinator to come with you with sorry i'm saying this in two different ways either the student or the advisor may ask each other you know could the disability services coordinator come with sometimes that's been helpful i mean i realize especially students who are earlier on who may not be as comfortable advocating for themselves um sometimes i've gone there just to take notes Sometimes I've gone to help with these discussions of a balanced course load. You know, because I think sometimes a student sees an advisor, an advisor makes recommendations, and the student thinks, oh, this is what I have to do. 
rather than seeing it as an advising relationship, you know, like, okay, this is what I have to do. Um, and so um, having these different, different options to either have other individuals present to help access that information and discuss someone's path, but then also to making sure that the information is provided to students in an accessible format. And I mean that in the broadest sense possible. graduate student and I was wondering what you would recommend to faculty that um, or um, research mentors that um, say that you can't only you can only learn through a certain method like writing research papers and not through other methods in that field that may be more accessible um, for example like developing videos or other ways of presenting um, research Can give a very direct response so far. <laughs> this is a very large campus. You are a very bright person. Go find a different faculty member. Especially if you're going to volunteer in the research lab. Like, your time is valuable. Now, the other maybe kinder version of that <laughs> um, would be speak the language that faculty know, which is that of research. So if you want faculty to use multiple means of assessment, go work with support services and disability services, or work with the Center for Teaching and Learning at MATC, or um, the Delta Project on this campus. Get some data, get some journal articles, and bring them to the faculty member and say, could we talk about multiple means of assessment? Here's some research that shows it helps students learn better. And then go from there. Because then you're speaking the, and you're using the coin of the currency that they know. Uh, and it's a lot maybe uh, to do that. So having faculty networks um, to help you do that. And that's the other thing. Sometimes faculty don't like to listen to students. Mm -hmm. And so finding a faculty advocate that will bring that topic up on behalf of all students, not just you. I would also say utilize the, fact, or the uh, undergraduate resource court or research coordinators for each department. Um, you guys one person who supervises all research in each department, and especially with those large classes that require some type of research, like by 152, um, that's definitely something you know, be able to help with and you know, assisting you with advocating for yourself and advocating for other people in their shoes. And I would add that talking to faculty members about what's the learning goal of this particular assignment. Right? Like, what am I supposed to be expressing here? So if this is an English class and the goal is to demonstrate your writing skills, then there might not be a lot of ways around that writing. But um, and if, like for my class um, at the end of the semester, they're doing presentations. But it's not a speech class that the goal is, I want you to be able to do a public presentation. The goal is, I would like you to share your work and get some feedback from your peers. And so that doesn't have to be a live speech. That can be something recorded in advance. That can be something that maybe you ask someone else to read aloud, but you have produced this work because the goal is to share the work, right? So thinking what through, helping faculty think through, because sometimes we don't fully think through what that learning goal is. We create an assignment kind of knowing it, but not articulating it. Um, understanding what's the learning goal of this assignment and what are the ways that this learning can be expressed. And that helps faculty kind of clarify to the student and then as a student you can then offer potentially other ways of doing that. So I think that that's an important thing to think about is what's the goal of this particular assignment in terms of expressing certain kinds of learning and knowledge. I would add as far as um, to glean ideas from other individuals, I think um, whether or not one has the means to attend an academic conference in your field of study, if you see on the schedule that there's graduate students or even faculty member who's working on issues related to those topics, and I think um, many conferences in the disability studies um, field offers those venues also in my field, which is higher education, there's increasingly more work on um, call students with disabilities and consequently grad students producing work. So I think 
getting in contact with those individuals, people producing research on this, but also understandably too, there's a, a great amount of practical tools per what the other panelists were saying. I think the onus shouldn't necessarily be on one person. There's, and, and thankfully the beauty of UW-Madison is its size and the number of individuals who are interested in a variety of things. So I, I, I would be surprised if there are people in this room afterward who can provide further elaboration of some of those potential tools. So just kind of building upon where you're situated and also turning to online mechanisms like discussion boards or Facebook groups, particularly dedicated to graduate students who have who face these similar types of challenges. Additional questions? <coughs> Hi. Um, so I'm a graduate student with a McBurney visa. And I know that one of the issues I have with my visa and other students that I've spoken to also with the uh, McBurney visa is that um, a lot of us feel that once we've given our McBurney visa, we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot for potential TA ship or PA ship in the future. Also, we're giving out a lot of information to people who may be our you know, future um, colleagues. So, um, and for me, especially I'm, on top of that, I'm 45 years old. So now I'm also speaking to faculty who are, faculty who are sometimes much younger than me. Um, so has the university maybe thought about working with the dean of students um, to, instead of getting us a McBurney visa, getting us a dean of students pass, note, or whatever, because I know there are other graduate students who have issues, who go to the dean of students to work with them, you know, maybe they've lost a spouse, something, or, you know, so instead of us having to give out this big Bernie visa that absolutely indicates that we are students with disabilities, what about something else that would just, you know, indicate that at the moment we may not be able to attend class, and that's what the dean of students said in period. Sarah, um, so I'm not from here, so I can't speak to um, to your institution, um, and we don't have that many graduate students um, at UW Whitewater. I would push back. I would, and I know this is easier said than done. Rather than focusing on a way to get visas or letters that are not disclosing your specific reason for need, so visa we know, disability, right? I would push back and work on changing the perception of what that means. Um, someone with a disability, it doesn't mean that um, they can't have a GA chef or a TA chef or be your colleague. It, and again, this is changing culture, so I know this is difficult, but ra rather than focusing our efforts on, to me that feels like a step back. Um, I would rather focus on efforts of changing that perception um, and that stigma associated with it. So are you suggesting that the student do that? that, that, that no, okay. no, no. Yes, could you please, along with your graduate work, <laughs> no, I believe that that should be an institutional um, effort. This is, this is Kirsten. I'm going to, I don't think I have a good answer for you, um, but I have been in your shoes. And so what I want to do is honor what you're calling out here because as a grad student, that stigma that you're facing is so substantive that it prevents people from disclosing because they think it's going to harm their future employment. And that's very powerful. And I will say, this is Sarah again, I come from a very privileged position of having gotten my PhD in disability studies with a disability, so I want to recognize that I didn't experience that stigma, so I just yeah. want to... And, and that the, the academy is different. Institutions are different. There are safe spaces, like disability studies, or safer spaces, and less safe spaces, like STEM and science. Um, so I don't have a good answer for you. Um, the closest thing I was able to do in my doctoral program is create a network. And to, it was... It was not a network necessarily that happened on my campus, but it did become my post-doctoral research community. And so I don't do research with people where I work, partially because Edgewood's very small, uh, partially because I've been mobile. I mean, academics are chronically mobile, right? Like we move all places for jobs. Um, but that community 
was really meaningful and important to me because I did not necessarily feel like I had the ability to um, always use accommodations in the graduate process. Uh, because, and, and I'm sure that I out of, and I, I've gone through, like if you look at my work, there's a progress of outing myself, <laughs> right? Um, but when I first started and when I was in the middle, I was not out. And so, because of that fear. So I don't have a good answer, but I do want to honor what you're bringing, and it's very real. Um, this is Sammy, and I just want to add to that, that as a larger institutional problem that potentially can be addressed by like graduate student shared governance and faculty shared governance is that we get a lot of information about pedagogy for undergraduate teaching and we get no training on how to work with graduate students. You are a graduate student one day, the next day you have a job and they're like, go work with graduate students. And you're like, I don't know, because I just was one. Um, so I think that there's significantly less conversation about accommodations for graduate students that faculty members often replicate whatever they experience, right? Because that's all we know. And so in replicating that, there tends to be more resistance to adjusting the way that they run a classroom or expect assignments or look for potential mentees and teaching assistants because there's just not a lot of conversation around it. Um, and again, that should not be on individual graduate students and individual disabled graduate students, but that the cultural shift around having these conversations about accessibility for disabled graduate students, disabled faculty, disabled staff, we're just starting to get there in these conversations. It has almost exclusively been focused on undergraduate students or K-12 students, as if somehow you just stop being disabled after you graduate college. Um, so that is not an answer to your question, um, so much as me kind of thinking through some of the reasons. And uh, I mean, I agree with Sarah and that I, I would feel like moving away from disclosure, moving away from talking about disability is a band-aid on a gaping wound. It's not going to really solve a problem. Um, but I also acknowledge that I come from gender and women's studies, which is a space that is invested in social justice and therefore is, tends to want to do better. And I am not in a space that is resistant to thinking more about disability and accommodations. I just want to add also that I am, I am, I have, I. I did actually start a group for grad students with disabilities, which I am going to get up and going, in part because the uh, the dean of graduate student has approached me. So if anyone after wants to speak about a grad group for students with disabilities, could I'll be... you potentially say and spell your name? So folks oh, sure. My first name is Britt B R I T T Marie M A R I E Zeiler Z E I D L E R. Um, oh, we are basically out of time. <laughs> so, um, if we could give a round of applause for our lovely panel. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. Please continue these conversations in your departments. The folks who come here to these sorts of things are the ones most amenable, so take it out to the people who aren't here. Thank you. <laughs>